Uh, welcome to The Bridge. We are a show which connects East and West. Today we have with us Thomas Pockin II. He is an American with 12 plus years living experience in China. He's the author of U.S. versus China, From Trade War to Reciprocal Deal, and a geopolitical consultant. He independently writes for the Singapore's News Asia, China Focus, Fox News, Daily Caller, Channel News Asia, and various other media on issues relating to Sino-U.S. relations, Asian Pacific politics, and economics. Welcome to The Bridge, Tom. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, we're happy to have you. Well, I want to start with the book. Sure. Uh, the trade war is ongoing. Yes. What's really the background that got it started? Why are we even having this kind of outcome? Well, no, it's a good question. And, and actually, the reason I wrote the book, because I think... A lot of times when I saw in the media, and also when a publisher approached me about writing a book, their concern was is that everyone focused on the current events, but they didn't really understand the background, they didn't understand the history. It was mostly either pro-Trump or anti-Trump attitudes. Mm. So what you had basically is whatever Trump said, either you loved it or you hated it. Mm. But there was no real analysis on the oh. actual trade or the reasons for it. And I actually believe that there are were are very significant reasons for having a trade war because obviously the Chinese had amassed record breaking trade surpluses with the US. And then you also had issues of IPR protections, intellectual property rights protections, and tech transfers. These were major concerns of the US. And the prior presidents before really didn't do anything about it. It was mostly a show. Oh, they would make a little bit of a few changes, but nothing dramatic. So part of Trump's appeal, I as a Republican, was this idea of this real America first policy. You know, to believe that your country is first, your country is number one, you do what you can to protect its U.S., its manufacturing, its economy. And Trump perceived it as problems with the U.S. manufacturing crumbling, and obviously, because of the generous trade deal and the most ma uh, favored nation status that the Washington gave Beijing, that it was his opinion that China was exploiting this. Now, it's understandable. But of course, you also have to think about the Chinese side, which I also emphasize in my book. So I alternated my chapters. I would explain the Trump side. Then I would go to the next chapter to explain the Chinese side. And by doing that, I was trying to stay neutral to show a neutral opinion, to show that both sides had very strong opinions, but at the same time, um, we had to find some way to resolve these issues. So let's think about China's side. At the time when they were offered these generous trade deals, if I was a leader, if I was a, a trade official in China, I would take it because it's very generous. It, it lowers tariffs. It gives China an opportunity to boost its manufacturing base. Why say no to it? So actually what I discovered was Trump was not blaming China. He was blaming the U.S. presidents. He was blaming the U.S. government for providing these generous trade deals with China. And it was just China taking advantage of the opportunity. And I think that was a very important point to make. Because in this whole anti-Trump attitude, they just wanted to have China angry at, at Trump. But they weren't really exploring what are the real reasons behind it. Currently, under the Biden administration, most of these tariffs are still in play. They sure. still exist. Is there any hope that in the future that this trade war will be resolved or return to a more normal set of free trade uh, opportunities between these two nations? Well, I believe that Trump and President Trump at the time, when he was in the White House and Xi, were starting to come to closer terms on a trade agreement. But then it got disrupted by Trump losing the election. I think what's going on is that Biden just doesn't know how to negotiate trade deals. It's very obvious. The Democrats take a very stubborn stand. They refuse to compromise. They refuse any negotiations. And they just expect everyone to fall in line. Whereas at least Trump, even though he was saying a lot of weird and whack wild statements on Twitter, he could still go behind the scenes and say, China, I'm just talking. What's, what, how are we going to make a deal? That's what business people do. 
That's what real business negotiators do, is they throw out an extreme position because they expect the other side to have an extreme position. And then they say, okay, now let's find a way to get in the middle. This is the proper way to handle trade negotiations. The problem with the Democrats and people like Biden is they throw out an extreme position and then say, we're not changing no matter what. This is the big problem that I think China has with the Biden administration, is this absolute refusal to make any compromise, to make any type of fine ways of consensus that allows for both sides to show that, they, they, that, that the other side gave something up. So basically, Trump understood it. But Biden has no concept of this. Blinken was recently in Beijing. Sure. And it does look like, in spite of a couple of little hiccups, that relations are at least starting to move in the right direction. How okay. do you feel about that? I don't that get either? that impression. Obviously, Biden, you have to think about that when Biden called Xi Jinping a dictator, you have to carefully analyze this. And I have. I've been asked to analyze this. The facts are facts that when a U.S. president is supposed to give a speech on any type of foreign policy issue, it must go through the U.S. State Department for approval. Which is blanket. Yes. And not only that, chances are any comments on foreign policy were most likely written and composed by the State Department. So you're suggesting that Biden's insult to the president of China originated with... Yes. Wow. Okay, let's say... But, but you have to look at the simple logic. There is no way the State Department was surprised by that comment. They didn't even deny that when they were asked. Hmm. Um, in terms of trying to normalize relations, it doesn't seem like we're headed in that direction so economically. It looks like with the, the added criticism and uh, tariffs against microchips and refusing to export certain kinds of microchips and putting pressure on allies around the world to sell not sell certain kinds of microchips to china that the trade war is worsening yes do you think that there is a chance and what what is the best hope for normalizing economic ties europe how, how could you elaborate well because europe is is in a difficult situation and i've had to analyze this as well why is it that Europe continues to side with Washington? Why is it that even though they express strong disagreements on a lot of major issues, that Europe always falls in line with Washington on the major issues? And then I also made this discovery in the US and confirmed it with even government officials I've talked to. NATO. NATO basically works this way. Many European governments do not want to pay for their defense. Mm -hmm. They're cheap. Yeah. They would prefer that they spend it on social welfare programs or whatever it may be. But if they spend it on defense, to, to them, they see it as some costs that are hard to recover. Mm -hmm. So NATO becomes the crux of their national security. Mm -hmm. They deliver the weapons. They deliver the safety. They deliver the any type of military alliances in case something goes wrong. So when the Ukraine, uh, Russia-Ukraine conflict erupted, it was a quick reminder to Europe of the significance of why they needed NATO to protect them from perhaps anything that might happen on the Russia side. So now the Europeans are even more strongly connected to NATO right now. And for that being said, this is why Europe, I believe, Europe continues to fall in support of Washington because of this reliance, over-reliance on NATO and this inability to just say, hey, let's just pay for our own defense so we can support our own sovereignty, which is something that Hungary is doing right now. Mm -hmm. They realize that this, this, this trap is not sustainable. So right now you have countries like Hungary who are trying to sort of find a way to create more sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And even someone like Macron, French President Macron, is starting to also open up to this reality. And so his trip to China was very significant because he's starting to realize that this NATO crutch is not going to help Europe. So the reason I emphasize Europe is I think the real weakness, 
the real break will likely happen from Europe. So you, what you're proposing is that as Europe develops its own defense capabilities mm -hmm. that, and becomes less reliant on the United yes. States, that European individual nations might be more willing to have deeper trade ties with China. Yes, just look at Hungary right now. They're doing that right now. They have, they have their foreign minister who took a trip to China and he's, he made some major trade agreements with with China and their foreign minister not only visited Beijing but went to Shanghai went to I believe Hangzhou mm -hmm. and they made some significant progress on their relations the Hung Hungary is a conservative country but at the same time they see the value in China for an economic side so I believe through this I think when China strengthens its types with Europe that could create some division between Europe and the US because the Europeans realize that chances are within the next few years, they're gonna be making more money from China mm -hmm. than from the US. Do you, I mean, we're both Americans. So okay, like, sure. I want what's best for America. Sure, my, family, my entire family is there. Almost yeah. all my sure. childhood friends are there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to me, you know, at a cursory yeah. look, yeah. that having bad trades with tr trade with the number one manufacturing base in the world sure. is good for the United States. Well, to a certain extent, I do understand the argument of strengthening the U.S. manufacturing uh, absolutely, base. Absolutely, yeah. Okay? Sure. So from a, a localism perspective, from a, 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 an issue of trade surpluses from the China side, there are definitely some strong arguments for a stronger U.S. manufacturing base. Mm -hmm. But here is what, and I've talked to this with Americans as well when I took my U.S. trip, is they there was a little bit of a simple understanding of opening up factories. Mm -hmm. They just thought it's like, you know, you build a building, it's open, then you set it up for operations and everything's fine. Isn't that what Tesla did? Well, Tesla, let's say they did, but it still takes time to yeah. do a factory. What yeah. you have to do is you have to think about all your suppliers. Mm. You got to think about your supply chains and see the problem is, is even if you want to open, transfer your factory, from China to the US, and I addressed this in my trade wars book, is the logistics alone is mm -hmm. not that simple. Mm -hmm. And it turns out I was reading an article, and it was from a person who was, uh, they interviewed somebody whose job was to re transfer factories from one country to another. Mm -hmm. And she actually explained that, it, yeah, right, sure. right, that for every factory that you transfer from one country to another, mm -hmm. even if it's a neighboring country, it takes one year. Mm. Because you got to sell the land, then you got to move the equipment, mm. then you got to uh, find new employees, mm. then you got to find new suppliers. Mm -hmm. It takes a year. No, at least. China has an amazing logistics network. Exactly. But aren't there, the United States still has the best universities in the world. Sure. So we should be theoretically one of the most innovative, if not in the top two or three most innovative countries in the sure. world. Aren't there new kinds of technologies that? Possibly we could be again manufacturing those sorts of things. It doesn't necessarily, I mean, maybe China is primarily manufacturing things that we buy at Walmart well, and yeah. refrigerators and laundry machines, but there are other technologies that the United States is producing that are unique to the United sure. States. We could produce those, no? Yeah, they, they're, they're very good at dryers. <laughs> I wish the Chinese were better at dryers. But they don't, actually, you know what's funny is in China you don't have a dryer. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's why I, I mentioned that. Maybe it's I'm going to awesome. compliment the Americans and, and uh, you guys do love your dryers. And I did appreciate the dryers <laughs> right there. And, uh, but I'm glad you mentioned technology. And this is why the 5G rivalry between the U.S. and China, China is way ahead of the U.S. and 5G. I was in the US and getting access to Wi Fi when I went someplace, I felt like it was almost like if I was in a rural area of China. Mm. It was the same challenges, the same slow speed. Mm. And it's because the US decided to do this decoupling, to not work with Chinese companies like Huawei to develop its 5G, it is way behind. And because of that, the future scientific development is not going to be happening in the U.S. anymore. It's going to be happening in Asia because their 5G is so much better. And the, the future of technology is going to be in AI and automated and mm. automation. Mm. And this requires better Wi-Fi. This requires 5G, 6G. If you don't have good 5G or 6G, 
you're going to be out of the game. Okay, the United States, I'm going off the yeah, script sure, a little sure, bit sure. here. The United States is a primary exporter of agricultural goods to sure. many countries around the world. And China imports an enormous sure. amount of agricultural goods from the United States. Now that maybe Boeing is going to be exporting some less things to yes. China, agricultural goods might overtake a lot of the sure. other goods that are coming from the United States to China. Isn't one of the things that Trump asked for in the trade negotiations that China import a certain amount of agricultural goods. I totally agree and with couldn't that. that could still be part of a solution yes. to the trade deficit to go back to the table. I totally say, hey, supported that. You guys need sorghum. We've got sorghum. Yeah. Let's make a deal. My trade book supported that concept. <laughs> yeah. Just just in the surplus. Buy more US energy. Buy more US agriculture. It's done. Mm. That's actually what Trump did. Mm. So we can, no, yeah. the idea of normalizing relations just takes getting back to the table exactly. and making common sense decisions together. Exactly. And that's what Trump was doing. Mm. That's what Biden is not doing. Mm. It, he makes it complicated because everything has to be addressed in a human rights perspective or a democracy perspective when Trump was talking to China like a business person. Mm. Um, you went back to Washington, yeah. New York, a couple other places sure. recently. Um, I'm curious, as yeah. I've been living in China for sure. more than 10 years, I've yeah. only gone back for a week or here, yeah, here and there. Here. Can you tell us uh, what are normal Americans' perspectives on China, not just, yeah. you know, media pundits? Sure, and I'm, that's a great question to ask because it really, you know, although I would say my U.S. trip was much tougher than I had anticipated in regards to culture shock issues. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that first? Well, um... What shocked you I don't going want to back get to too America. much in trouble with certain people, <laughs> but let's just say I arrived in the U.S. in June, which is known for a particular month in the U.S., Pride Month. Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, okay. And I'm just a conservative who's lived in China for a long time. I have a family. i got a lovely wife and son. And um, I'll just put it to you this way, that China is a little bit different in how it celebrates Pride Month. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So... Um, it was, that was a major culture shock for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I had anticipated that, but what I didn't anticipate was, for example, the infrastructure mm -hmm. was absolutely awful in New York, especially. It's actually gotten worse. Much worse. Even compared to 2019, when I was there, the roads are in bad shape. The bridges are in bad shape. What happened to the public transportation? Back better? <laughs> there wasn't there a trillion dollars? Yeah, he would think. Well, guess what? There's a lot of corruption, and I saw it. And the corruption is bad in the U.S. And it was, it's become more obvious. It's become much more obvious. There was a time when I was a kid, corruption was perceived as only something that third world countries were doing. Mm. It, now they're boasting of it. Now they're not even ashamed of it anymore. In Washington, they're like, we're open for business. You want to have a meeting? This is our, they don't say what the price tag is, but, you know, they have their, let's just say, office workers to make it difficult for people to meet Congress people and senators unless you are benefiting their campaign war chest. And it was very obvious this was a game being played in Washington as well. So the corruption really shocked me. The poor infrastructure really shocked me. The poor 5G development really shocked me. So what I'm trying to get at is what I don't think the world has realized, China is winning. The U.S. is not. But what the U.S. is doing is they're playing mind games on the world with its media to make everyone think that the U.S. is way ahead. Mm. I saw it myself. I've lived in China and my standard of living here mm. is significantly better than what I believe my standard of living would be in America. I mean, I want to ask you a question yeah. because I, I'm curious. I don't yeah, know yeah, the yeah. answer, though. Yeah, sure. So, um... What are solutions to helping solve the problem of corruption in the United States? Because obviously, yeah. the trains are derailing. Exactly. I mean, it's not it just... It happened the, this morning. Yeah, it's not just even happening on the news. It's yeah. just happening and they're not even reporting. And I was on Amtrak. Almost every day. I was on Amtrak. So, I, I'm not surprised. And so, this is not a tenable way to run a society. Exactly. An advanced, civilized yes. country that is one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest by uh, mm -hmm. some standards in the world... How can we fix these problems? Well, you know, I've told a lot of people this because I address these very issues with the people I spoke with. And what I actually told them, and I said, one of the things that really impressed me of Chinese President Xi Jinping was his crackdown on corruption. Hmm. 
people in the West kind of criticized it. They made it sound like this was just for him trying to get rid of his rivals, that this was just a, a game or, or, or showpiece. Mm. No, it was for real. There were corrupt people who were going to jail. We know of it. We've mm. heard of it. We lived in China during that crackdown and corruption time. And it is... So this is a problem for the FBI, is what you're saying. Well, what I'm getting at is the corruption has to be cracked down. Mm. You have to stop the corruption first. Because at the core is where the problems lie. And if you don't fix the core, it will not get fixed. Mm. Okay? In order to fix the core, you have to crack down on corruption. That is what Chinese President Xi Jinping did. Mm. He fixed the core problems to be able to get China to move ahead. Because if you don't fix the corruption, it's game over for your country. All right, so back to the question yeah. that I threw you off of. Yeah, sure. Regular Americans. Yeah. When you're, oh, in, yeah, when sure. you're in the States, what did they think of China? Most of regular Americans I spoke to gave me hope. Uh, actually, when I, I had a meeting with some people I met when I came back from the U.S., and let's just say at the time I was still um, emotionally deprogrammed mm. from the U.S. because of the culture shock I saw, the uh, corruption I had witnessed. It really shocked me because it was my country. Mm. And I was, let's just say, I wouldn't say it was a meltdown, but I was very upset. Mm -hmm. And I had a discussion with people I normally have a civil discussion with. Mm -hmm. And I actually literally just exploded. And I said, look, America's a mess. It's in a bad situation, but I still have some hope. It's mm -hmm. when I went to places like New Hampshire mm -hmm. and I met regular, ordinary Americans. Mm -hmm. They gave me some hope because I see that they're still at heart good people, mm -hmm. that they actually want to have a better world and China isn't such a big issue for them. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, it's a big so issue. What yeah. are big issues for regular American folks? The economy. Of course. Right? Yeah. Of course, yeah. like everyone. Yeah. We have to care about our finances. We have to care about our children, our children's education. And obviously our education system has really fallen apart in America. Do people feel threatened by China? Like, did you mention the uh, balloon scandal? No. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, every once in a while, an ordinary American person might, for whatever reason, like if I go through, say, customs, or for whatever reason they had to look through my passport, mm -hmm. they would see China. Yeah. There's no way to hide it. Yeah, it's China. China, China, China. <laughs> it's all over. I'm all over the place. And then I would I was expecting like, oh my god, I'm gonna hear it now. Oh, really? Interesting. So how's China? Mm. It yeah. was just like a normal question. Normal conversation. Yeah, a normal conversation. So the, uh, so the perception of for me at least, yeah. living here in China, I see the United States through its media. Sure. So my perspective is whatever they're saying on all of left, yeah, right, all of the sure. spectrum, yeah. I'm like, oh, it doesn't sound like America I know. has... No, and I was expecting the same like you like you just mentioned. So and Americans know the media is lying. Wow. They know, they figured out the, the media, media is just a fraud. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think I did see your, your tweet about how the Americans don't believe the media. Mm. That is absolutely true. I, I've also read, and this wasn't in that tweet, that yeah. newer platforms like TikTok sure. and uh, I, I don't even know, yeah. some Snapchat, whatever, right. I don't even know what these yeah. are really. Sure. They are places where young people are getting their news. And plus it's alternative voices. I think people are getting sick and tired of these elites. And this is why Trump has had such an appeal. Mm. It's not about his politics or that he's a jerk and obnoxious. And I'll agree that he probably is a jerk and obnoxious and probably an <laughs> evil man as well. But at the same time, he has an appeal to people like me because we feel left out. And so when Trump talks about people like the forgotten man and woman, and mm -hmm. I also address that in my Trade Wars book, mm -hmm. is that you really get this sense that you're left out. Yeah. When I'm in Washington, even when I went to an important conference and I was actually able to get into the Senate, U.S. Senate building, which felt like a big deal for me mm -hmm. there's always this impression like oh you're this new guy that's okay i mean i'm used to the new guy thing but it was like so obvious mm -hmm. that you're just not one of us yet you have to earn your ability to join in and this go along get along kind of attitude so you have to get is just, yeah i mean it's just <laughs> so obvious mm -hmm. and even when i was younger it wasn't that yeah. So as I said, coming back was just like I was really deprogramming mm. because it was like all the exaggerations I heard about America, all these conspiracies, 
were actually true. Mm. It was, it, it, and I, to be honest, I cried almost like I didn't, uh, I, I, my, I didn't let my wife and son see it, yeah. but I cried when I came back because it was like, this is my country. Yeah. Yeah. We have a new election cycle coming. Sure. Out. Um, how do you think that is going to, I, I, I'm actually really curious to ask you about sure. inside the Republican party, but I'm not going That's to okay. until after the show, maybe, sure. unless you answer with those, those no problem. My questions accidentally. Yeah. But how do you think the next election cycle is going to affect Sino-U.S. relations? Well, it's obvious that even when I spoke to Republican leadership people, that there is this strong animosity against Trump. So even on the Republican side, the oh yeah, really? I'm, I'm talking about surprised. the Republican leadership, not the ordinary, uh, the ordinary Republican. All of them love Trump. Mm. You, you can't separate their love for Trump from anything. Mm. But the leadership just doesn't get it. They don't understand why regular people love Trump so much. They're like, oh, he's a jerk. Oh, he's talk crazy. He does all this and that. But deep down, Trump appeals to the people who feel left out. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you literally, like when you mentioned the issues of TikTok and these new platforms, this is an opportunity for a regular person to possibly have some success mm. and get their voice heard mm. and suddenly create attention. Because it used to be you had to rely on the mainstream media for your messaging. You had to yeah, rely. Rather. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's... And if you don't get into the club, you're out. Mm. So this is why there is that strong appeal for that kind of social media, especially from Americans. It's because the regular person gets their voice heard. You don't get that from the mainstream media. There is this strong censorship going on. So in regards to the issue of the U.S. elections, and I, when I talked to some people in the Republican leadership circles, it was very obvious they do not like Trump. And they will do whatever it takes to stop him from becoming. So does that mean that DeSantis is going to be? So could be. So what is if, if it's DeSantis versus Biden or DeSantis versus Harris or something Or even like that. if DeSantis wins, no change. It's just going to continue. The madness of U.S.-China relations are going to continue on its destructive path. So, okay, what can a regular ordinary, because this show is called The Bridge. Sure. Our goal is to increase understanding between yeah. these our two countries. So... What can ordinary Americans who want better normalized sure. relations, if it still can be competitive, but more sure. normalized diplomatic relations between these two countries, how can they be part of a solution that helps us get along better? Well, I also like to call myself a bridge builder as a consultant as well. And I think it's basically going to be just the face-to-face -face exchanges, more mm. visits. Please come visit China. Mm. So people, a lot of people, people ask me, they're very curious about China. But it never entered their mind that maybe they should visit the country. Yeah. I encourage them to come. Yeah. I, I encourage people to try to get, yeah. hey, you know, university in America is extremely expensive and yes. it's not here. Why don't you come over exactly. here and get your bachelor's or master's degree? You know, just message me on Twitter. I'll show you how it's and done. And not only that, I just saw an article this morning about U.S. diplomats complaining that there's not enough Americans studying in China. Maybe this is an outcome because... One but it's actually the, the Washington's fault for that. <laughs> but one of the talking points in, in the Blinken Sheet yeah. meeting was yeah. in, they would they would create the facilities necessary for more people to people exchanges. Maybe this is. I support that. I, yeah. I, I hope that both sides can. I think yeah. more Chinese students should go back. I know that they, it's sure. dangerous for them a little yeah. bit right now. Sure. However, I think that there's a big opportunity for Americans to not have 30,000 US dollars in student exactly. le debt when they graduate. I would love to, to see more, China. I would love to see more Americans here study in China. Yeah. I, I would love to see more Americans come here. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, given the size of our two economies and ignoring each other is off. Unless you're one of these decoupling people, which sure. seems really far out there to me, yeah. honestly. Um, ignoring each other is out of the question. Yeah. So what are the opportunities or how can the United States and China work together on necessary international endeavors like climate change, for example? Sure. I think it's a fair question to ask. And actually, I believe this is a possibility. At least the Chinese side has an ability to work with the Democrats. But here's a big problem. And I've actually done some deep analysis on this very climate change issue. Uh, they are demanding... Um, for example, 
trade protectionism on a lot of the windmills and a lot of the solar panels that are being manufactured in the U.S. But the problem that occurs is a lot of those components come from China. And now they're trying to block that. I mean, I, from a free trade perspective, yeah, I'm not an economist. Sure. But I, I understand the idea is basically wherever it can be made cheapest and fastest. Okay. We buy it from them and it saves everyone money. Is that not true? Well, I mean, and this is where I probably will differ with you, is that I think that countries to, sh to sh sometimes um, demonstrate their sovereignty uh, should not follow blindly the free trade policy. Mm. Because I believe that when you allow it, it then creates a central, um, that one world government kind of concept that leads to that. So I think at times governments should show their sovereignty. So I would support tariffs at times and issues like that. But I had some discussions with some people who supported higher tariffs, but they also supported blocks against China. And I said, look, how about instead of blocking trade with China, mm -hmm. you focus more on tariffs? Mm -hmm. Because then if China goes wrong, you just increase the tariffs. But if China shows improvement, you lower the tariffs. So then you create this carrot and stick mm -hmm. uh, process. And that's what Trump was doing. But the problem with blocks is you immediately create the rupture. There's no turning back. Mm -hmm. When the United States increased tariffs on China during the Trump administration, sure. China increased tariffs back. Sure. And when Biden increased tariffs on some certain specified yeah. technologies, China increased tariffs back. Sure. Um, is this a good, positive process? I support that, actually. I support that process because if you see the title alone, my title of the book is U.S. vs. China from Trade Wars to Reciprocal Deal. Mm -hmm. Re reciprocity is all about equal and fair treatment on both sides. Mm -hmm. So if one side raises tariffs, the other side raises tariffs. If you want the other side to lower tariffs, you lower your side. You have to show an ability that you can work together. And so by when you lower tariffs, if the other side reciprocates and lowers their tariffs, it, it creates and it, it encourages both sides to lower tariffs. Mm -hmm. But if, uh, if one side feels the other side is not following the rules or, or, or cheating or somehow taking advantage, then you know they have the right to increase their tariffs, expecting the other side to do the same. Well, let's go back to we were talking about sitting down at the table together. Sure. Let's say maybe the United States wants to protect uh, solar PV or wind okay. technology in local industries sure. to protect the U.S. economic sure. interests. Um, if China were to buy more sorghum and wheat and other things, would that be on? I would say that's reciprocity. Mm. I would call it reciprocity. I'm sure, the people in the U.S. As long PV as there's some balance. Won't like it. If there is some balance. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying if there's some balance... Right. You don't have to do it just on tariffs. Reciprocity can be just by purchasing agriculture in replacement in, in, in return for lower tariffs on something else. Mm -hmm. Okay? Reciprocity isn't just exactly always about tariffs from industry to industry. Yeah. It could be like what you just described. I like your idea. Mm. Um, there are a lot of U.S. businesses doing business in China. Sure. I heard it was 70,000 companies. Yeah. I, don't, I don't really, I've never seen 70,000 companies. <laughs> but um, I know companies like Apple, Starbucks, Coca-Cola, sure. Tesla, Tesla, Disney has two theme parks. So if you count yeah. Hong Kong and oh, yeah. Shanghai, uh -huh. I've been to both actually. And my, you, my family did too. You loved it. Yeah. Um, how do you see in the short term biz, U.S. businesses in China, given the rhetoric coming out of the United States? It's going to be businesses that find a way to improve U.S.-China relations. It's not going to be politics. It's not going to be the diplomats. So it's Elon going to be the business. Tim Cook. Yeah, Bill what they're Gates. doing. Yes, that's what's going to happen because the diplomats from the U.S. side do not understand China. They've made it very obvious they don't understand China, and they're not interested in understanding China. Uh, the politicians in the U.S. government are not interested in underst understanding China. Mm -hmm. So it's just going to be simple. Business people want to see benefits. They're making money in China, so they'll want to see better relations. 
Do you, I mean, I understand. That's my hope, too. Sure. I, every time one of these billionaire CEOs comes to China, yeah. I'm like, hooray. Yeah. This is a kind of a form of diplomacy. Sure. But how do U.S. actual State Department diplomats look at Tim Cook doing diplomacy for, China, <laughs> for the United States? They get jealous. <laughs> they get jealous because they get better treatment. Than the <laughs> and I don't blame China for doing what it's doing because, obviously, if the diplomats are are doing and allowing Biden to call Xi Jinping a dictator. Yeah. Elon's not going to do that probably. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, can increase business cooperation. Well, actually you already yeah, answered that sure. question. In what ways has China changed in the last 10 years since you, oh, 12. 12 yeah, 12 years. Years. yeah so 2010. One of the big things people don't really understand is the speed, China speed. Yeah. I've heard this term from exactly. a few different people. What is China speed? How has China changed in the last 12 years? What do, some Americans maybe not understand about the way China is now. China's is, China is, its economy is for real. I mean, we look at these buildings outside, I mean, some amazing buildings, and this is, this is what China has become, a booming economy, a prosperous country, even more so than when I came here in 2010. And like you said, the speed, I think when I first came, China was still in a little bit of a learning process. Uh, I don't want to say the details because you actually know what could happen. But I will say that China learned fast mm -hmm. and is moving fast. And I just don't think the Americans realize it. Mm -hmm. And that this is, I mean, you go to cities like Beijing, Xi'an, Shenzhen, um, some of the major cities here. You can have a very good life, mm. and the infrastructure is absolutely amazing. The technology is amazing. Okay, so maybe your social media may not have some freedoms that you normally would have in America, um, but you're safe here. The prime, and I also know that G's crackdown on corruption has made tremendous strides. This is the second time you brought that up because it's really I really believe. That what I'm telling Americans is that G's crackdown on corruption is the model mm -hmm. to some find, some way for America to recover. They have to fix the corruption problems. May I? And 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 and, and I don't think the Americans have the heart for it anymore. Based on this presidency yeah. and the last presidency, sure. I don't know a lot about the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Yeah. I No, sure. I should say, I almost know nothing okay. about them. Mm -hmm. However, I do know that it seemed like, as a media watcher, sure. that during one administration, they were on that administration's side. During the other yeah. administration, they are on the other administration's side. Absolutely true. Is there, I mean, because they're the, that is they're part the, of the corruption. tool. If, I mean, but they're the, only, they're the ones that are supposed to be the crackdown or people cracking down on corruption. That's why I like to emphasize the crackdown on corruption. <laughs> because what happens with corruption is the enforcer of the laws yeah. turn corrupt, turn biased, turn prejudiced, protect their people. Mm. And that is when corruption becomes out of control. Mm. When you lose the ability to crack down on the corruption, you have reached a point of no return. If you look about, and I love to read history. I'm a person who reads on average 40, at least 40 books a year. Mm. Wow. Okay. So I've read a lot of, and I, I do it because I want to understand. I always believe as a, ge uh, as a geopolitical consultant and a researcher, my job is to understand the world and I always boil it down to this. It's human nature. Mm -hmm. So I've done a lot of reading up on, say, European history and how its great empires fell apart. And if you look at the core of all empires falling, it was always corruption that was the beginning of the end. I, would, I mean, yeah. I, I used to study history. My master's yeah, yeah, in sure. history, I thought it was overextension. No. I think um, the extension, what normally happens is it becomes, shall we say, um, an over-ambitious patriotic spirit. Your country is wonderful, you're great, so you want to expand your country size or its territories to ex increase the influence. But what creates the decline is not 
the overstepping, it's when the core, your heart, becomes corrupted. Mm -hmm. And then whatever you expand it to, also you can't hold on to anymore mm -hmm. because you turn to weak. And the corruption actually weakens people because instead of, like for example, when, when Xi Jinping talks about the Chinese dream, he's talking about creating a better China, a mm -hmm. stronger China. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. dream, actually, and I mentioned this in my Trade Wars book, is about just making you yourself better. I think um, yeah. when I think of the American yeah. dream, uh -huh. it's about having a house. Yeah, exactly. Two kids. Yes. A dog. Sure. A nice yard. Of course. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah. And that's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> but what, Maybe what, what, what's happening now <laughs> is people have that. But then what else? Once you have, it's, and I've made this discovery at times when I've enjoyed some moments of success mm -hmm. that, oh, it's wonderful. I now have some success. But what ends up happening is you then want something more. Mm. And then, or you become more interested in something else. You become, okay, I've accomplished my life goal. Mm. Now what next? So I think what happened is that ambitiousness, when I mentioned earlier, like you sort of mentioned, is there's, there becomes an overreach. Mm -hmm. Okay, you've gotten what you want. Mm -hmm. What next? It is just human nature. Mm -hmm. But what breaks it apart is that corruption issue. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes all about you. All about your selfishness. Screw everybody else as long as I gain. Mm -hmm. That's why the heart of corruption becomes so destructive. Because you are willing to destroy everybody else to protect you and your own people. So we should just be looking at a congressperson's bank account? <laughs> okay. I want to be interesting. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it'd be interesting I if think, we I think we can in some cases. <laughs> Actually, it's been done. Yeah. Um, from the 1990s, yeah. I'm not going to mention the author's name, but there was an author and many other uh, political analysts who, sure. who thought China was going to collapse. Of course. And they keep, many of them, oh, yeah. not just one individual, not picking on one sure. person, keep saying this every few years, even up until now. Mm -hmm. It doesn't certainly doesn't look that way on yeah. the ground here. Uh, what do you see in the short and midterm for China's economy? Well, it's it's a tricky question, and actually, I, I one of the things I did is I did have to write up some reports while I was there, and there was one report where I focused on because I I, t I tend to make forecasts, mm -hmm. and when I did the U.S. economy, it was very obvious inflation is much worse in in, in America than it is here, mm. and things are so much more expensive. Mm. But the thing is, is people are addicted to their credit cards. Mm. Credit cards is like their security blanket. So they continue living the high life on debt. Mm -hmm. Sooner or later, they're going to have to pay that back. Mm -hmm. South Korea went through that phase a few years ago mm. where they just overloaded on household debt and then they had to recover from it. Mm -hmm. And that's why the South Korean economy had a lot of trouble. But at least I'll give the South Koreans credit for this. Mm -hmm. They tried to fix it. Mm -hmm. The Americans aren't even interested. Mm -hmm. They continue to focus on debt. They don't care about debt. They just continue to live in a fantasy world where they just can keep thinking they can live as they are now. Mm -hmm. But when the inflation keeps going higher, when people start, when you see more layoffs happen, mm -hmm. the economy is going to get hit hard. And I think it's already happening now. Okay, and this is how foolish the American media is, including the business media. They were all excited that China's trade figures went lower in May. Mm -hmm. Well, why would China's trade figures and exports go lower in May? Because American consumers are going to buy less. Why? Because they realize that they are overextending on their credit cards. Mm. They are starting to lose jobs. Mm. They better start cutting back. I've talked to some regular Americans. They're starting to realize, wow, maybe I'm spending too much. Maybe we need to start cutting back. Okay? So what I'm getting at is when you see the U.S. business media, you know, cheer that America's trade figures went down, they should actually be worried. Mm. So you're saying, if I try, if I'm going yeah, to try yeah. to sum this up. Yeah, yeah. China delivered slightly less manufactured goods abroad. Sure. And you're saying that's not a reflection of the weakness of China's economy. That's a reflection of the U.S. economy. 
because and the European economy too. But I mean, you were also, if I might, uh, yeah, sure. try to add some value to this. Yeah, you're also saying the Americans are using credit cards like a security blanket. So yes. maybe it's a good thing that they're spending no. less. Oh well, yeah. Well, you're right. I, I mean, I do agree with that aspect. Mm -hmm. They need to cut back. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to also get at is. The fact that you had, and I saw some articles where they were all excited about China's so-called downturn because mm. of the lower trade figures. Mm. But the facts are, that's actually a reflection mm -hmm. of the Western economy, mm. not China's economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, IMF But I would agree think, with you on the credit cards as I, well. IMF seems yeah. to think that China's going to do something like 5.7% sure. GDP growth yeah. by the end of the year. I don't know. China's only shooting for 5%. So even yeah. if IMF is wrong, China's probably going to still hit its own figures for itself. Yeah, five percent is really good. It is really good. Yeah. America would be just <laughs> jumping for joy <laughs> exactly. if they could get that. If they could get two percent, yeah, two like, percent. Well, I mean, the, well the, the Trump, Trump is, was is, giving. What yeah. I understand in a developed economy, the reality is that it is harder to get higher numbers. Sure. So, um, most people who come to China, they say, I'm coming to China for one year. Oh yeah. You've been here I've been, uh, a I was, lot longer. It was probably that. similar. Yeah. So what kept you staying for this long? I think it was, you know, when I lived in America, I already saw America already going on to decline in 2010. And it was like... I wouldn't have guessed in 2010. Well, one of the reasons I like forecasts <laughs> is <they're painful laughs> yeah. because I'm very good at making predictions. Well, okay. Yeah. So um, let's just say I have some good intuition. Mm. And... I was already feeling that America was already a little bit on the on going a little bit on the downhill. And I kept hearing about China on the rise, China is moving up. And I think, you know, I like being in a place where there's a future. When why stay someplace when it's already going down, mm -hmm. no matter how powerful it is. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's the hope. This is just the belief that China's on the rise, China's succeeding. This is where the future is, and it just keeps me going. Well, thank you so much for your time. All right. Yeah, sure.